Tuesday, June 26, 2012. At 10 p.m., the gendarme at Beigne in the French region of Charente receive a call from the fire department. There's a blaze at a house in Barbizieux, a dozen kilometers away. 20 minutes later, with the fire under control, gendarme Jean-Luc Forestier arrives on the scene. A firefighter accosts him. He says, sir, there's something wrong. Take a look out back. Straight away, I can see significant traces of blood on the gravel. And on a shutter under control, then he shows me what looks like the body of an elderly person lying at the entrance of the door. Traces of blood are everywhere. The situation is clear. There has been foul play. To start with, let's not mince words here. We have a body that's been carved up. The first thing you think when you see something like that is that you need to find out who did it. It's horrible. Investigations are immediately entrusted to the Gendarmes Research Unit in Poitiers. This crime scene is very complex. This is a large property. Outside, some aspects were immediately noticeable, where traces of blood were evident. Plus, the bedroom was obviously very important because of all the blood found there. So the immediate question is, what could have happened in this house? How does the fire fit in with the course of events? Was it a premeditated act? Has anything been stolen? All these questions are asked as the investigation begins to build assumptions about what may have happened. The investigators quickly learn that the victim is the owner of the premises. Her name is Claude Tavernier. She is 83 years old. A pathologist is called in to make an initial assessment. The body of the victim is lying on the dining room floor. The expert immediately notices various injuries. Examination of the body revealed fatal wounds in the area of the cervical vertebrae. They exhibited the typical characteristics of a knife attack. The use of a stabbing weapon implies that the murderer was positioned near his victim. Had any footprints been left that might identify the killer? Experts take DNA swabs from the body and scrapings from beneath the nails of Claude Tavernier. The criminal identification technicians then comb the house under the supervision of Chief Warrant Officer Michel Faure. Les divers points d'incendie Various small fires had been started, but they didn't spread, meaning that the fire had not destroyed evidence as the perpetrator presumably intended. Large quantities of blood are found in the bedroom. Extensive investigations are carried out. In this room and on the bed, we find evidence that will prove to be decisive during the rest of the investigation, such as a brown packing tape and a white cigarette lighter. This lighter does not belong to the victim, while the sticky tape bears fragments of hair, which will be analyzed later. In the dining room, a tipped-over tray and a broken pair of glasses seem to suggest signs of a struggle. A table knife is also found there. Investigators also discover that a TV set, a bronze clock, and the victim's bank card are missing. The fact of there being a robbery suggests that maybe a burglar was disturbed by the property owner and a struggle ensued. The obvious assumption is a burglary that went wrong. The burglary hypothesis becomes more credible when a few hours later, the victim's car is found torched three kilometers away. As in any criminal investigation, no lead is ruled out. So to find out more about the victim, the police carry out a character analysis. It could be a crime of passion, 
or the motive might be purely iniquitous. We start with a blank page, and we need to be able to gather all the evidence to determine what happened, how it happened, and who did it. After the death of her husband, a former soldier, Claude Tavernier lived alone in her big house. She has a large family with five children, two sons and three daughters, along with 30 or so grandchildren. So her home is full of joy, a center for family get-togethers. We learn that Madame Tavernier is a person with no criminal history, someone liked by all, who is close to many people in Barbezieux, and who seemingly has no problems with anyone. Despite her age and large family, this sweet and generous woman was always very involved in the life of her village. She helped out neighbors, gave catechism classes, reached out to the poor. This was the woman described to me. They called her the Queen of Hearts. She was well known to the mayor, to the social services, to the parish priest. She was very involved with all the local charities. She was so well loved and well known that when word of her death got around, a protest march was organized, which is something you don't see every day. Mrs. de Vernier was not a typical murder victim. It's hard to say who might want to kill such a person. Was it for money? Was the motive linked to her own personality, to her family? It didn't seem like it, so we had no direct motive. With the character analysis having revealed nothing remarkable, the investigators hope an examination of the car might deliver new clues. A complete search of the car was carried out in the hunt for a murder weapon or other evidence related to the victim or the perpetrator. De la victime ou de l'auteur. The investigations carried out on the vehicle unfortunately yielded nothing. Lots of unanswered questions. Was a burglar trying to escape? Trying to mask his crime? Did he leave with the car, then burn it somewhere? At this stage, we really are in the dark. The day after the tragedy, a man is arrested for car theft. He's already known to the police for his involvement in incidents of theft with violence. The man lives in an encampment not far from where Claude Tavernier's vehicle was found. For the investigators, it's a lead worth pursuing. The vehicle was discovered near a traveler's camp a community that had been a hotbed of criminal activity in recent months. It all points to members of this community being involved in the crime. Telephone monitoring is immediately set up on both the suspect and all his relatives. Since this is a community that doesn't like to cooperate with the police, the phone taps provide information on what is happening and what kind of information is being passed around. We use it as our ears. But no evidence arises from the phone taps, and the lead proves to be a dead end. <laughs> On June 27, 2012, the day after the incident, the body of Claude Tavernier is transported to the Forensic Institute of Poitiers. During the external examination, the pathologist finds many bruises on the body. According to Dr. Bernard Mach, these types of injury are symptomatic. The bruising indicates that the victim was subjected to violence or manhandling, causing ruptures of small blood vessels prior to death. It is indicative of a struggle or of being physically dragged around while alive, because post-mortem, bruising cannot occur. While these bruises prove that the victim sought to defend herself, they were not fatal. Further post-mortem examination, though, will establish the exact cause of Claude Tavernier's death. 
In this case, it's mostly the lesions in the cervical spine area that caused the victim's death, leading to the main blood vessels being damaged. In total, over 40 stab wounds were inflicted, indicating a frenzied and murderous attack. The autopsy also reveals more about the murder weapon, including the dimensions of the blade with which Claude Tavernier was stabbed. The autopsy provides clear evidence regarding the width of the blade used, which is a little more than 2.5 centimeters, indicating the approximate maximum width of the knife blade. Investigators can now compare this description with a table knife found in the victim's dining room. There are some small, sharp wounds, lesions of another kind. So by analyzing the skin and shape of the lesions, especially the angle of penetration and the way the blade penetrated, we can eliminate any ordinary kitchen knife with a rounded tip. As the results of the autopsy emerge, indicating the violence shown by the murderer, the people of Barbizieux are totally stunned. The town was already shocked by the murder. And news of the frenzied attack involving 43 stab wounds only amplified the effect. My recollection is that the town was reeling as details of the case emerged. But the conclusions from the autopsy also sow doubt in the minds of the investigators. We've dealt with plenty of homicides in the past, but such a frenzied attack on someone over the age of 80, with more than 40 stab wounds and the way she was dragged around, suggests a degree of extreme violence that isn't compatible with a burglary. There might be a connection between murderer and victim. The attempted arson suggests a cover-up, an attempt to erase all traces of the crime just committed which makes you wonder what possible connection there might be between the perpetrator and the victim. A survey of the neighborhood is launched. Who did Claude Tavernier spend time with? Did neighbors notice anything on the day of the tragedy? The police go door to door hoping to unearth new evidence. You know you're going to get information, but there's the issue of reliability. Some have seen things but prefer not to say anything, while others have seen nothing but still have a lot to say. You need to separate the wheat from the chaff. We have to see what's relevant and what isn't, see what's leading us up the wrong track. The main thing for us is to leave the door ajar to find out who committed the murder. One witness statement is of particular interest to investigators. The night of the murder, a man was seen running near Claude Tavernier's house. This person, whom we shall call Jean-Louis, is quickly identified and interviewed by the gendarme. We went to see him, talked to him, and tried to find out what he was doing there. He initially denied having been in the area, contradicting our eyewitness account. So this was troubling and picked our curiosity. The witness, however, is sure that it was Jean-Louis he saw running that night. When interviewed again, the suspect offers an entirely different version. Then he says, Actually, maybe I was there. I remember I had to run because I lost my dog. The explanation sounds dubious. Why didn't he say that the first time, so as to eliminate any suspicion or doubt? So we seize all the clothes he was wearing that day and take DNA samples. The samples are sent to the laboratory for analysis. At the same time, investigators receive the results of the DNA samples taken from the body of Claude Tavernier. In addition to the victim's genetic fingerprint, the experts discover a male DNA profile, one that isn't logged at the National DNA Database. The profile of the person whose DNA is found on the body is not known to us, so it becomes our mission to put a name to that profile. 
the gendarmes are convinced that the DNA belongs to the murderer. But when compared to the samples taken from Jean-Louis, the two DNAs do not match, ruling him out as a suspect in the investigation. The investigation seems to have come to a halt when suddenly new evidence emerges to revive the case. Sylvain Morin says that on the night of the murder, he reported to the gendarmerie for duty, only to realize that he had forgotten his keys. So he decided to go home and pick them up. At around 8 p.m., returning to the gendarmerie, he passed Claude Tavernier's house. Donc j'ai vu. I saw someone emerge from the residence wearing a gendarme's polo shirt. He was carrying a jacket, which he quickly slipped on. After that, I continued on my way, and he carried on his. Obviously, for us, this was an essential piece of information. Someone seen leaving the building within a few minutes of the crime is a key piece of evidence. Although it was all over within a few seconds, Sylvain Morin is able to give a fairly accurate description of the man he saw. The first thing I noticed, aside from his gendarme's uniform, with no weapon at the belt, was that he was a young man of 20 to 25 years old, around 5 feet 9, with short, wavy, fair hair. For us, this was a new lead, but a hard one to follow up because it called for a great deal of investigation. It could be anyone. To further their investigation, the police envisage several hypotheses. There were many soldiers in Madame Tavernier's family. And as the gendarmes are part of the military, we were interested in finding out if any relatives might have been wearing a polo shirt of this type, or had been members of the gendarmerie at some time or other. When the checks failed to yield any results, we focused on current or recent members of the gendarmerie, and anyone who could have acquired such a polo shirt by some other means. So at this stage, the investigators were saying that, odd as it may seem, one of their colleagues might be a suspect in this case. A list is drawn up of all the gendarmes, former gendarmes, and reservists in the Charente area. So we have more than 3,000 names at this point. People who can match the profile of the individual seen coming out of Claude Tavernier's property. At this stage, we were planning on interviewing everyone in order to account for their movements, see where they were on the night of the 26th. Fortunately, thanks to the precise... Mathieu Bulens is immediately summoned as a witness. He tells us that on the evening of the crime, he was in Barbezieux, where he had a date at 9 p.m. with a girl he'd made contact with via the internet. He was due to meet her in the street where Mrs. Tavernier lived. The young man says he waited for the girl for quite a while, but she didn't show. As the crime was being committed, he was within 300 meters of Claude Tavernier's house, but said he didn't notice anything. For us, his story didn't make sense. He would have seen the firefighters, seen the gendarmes, seen a fire starting. His statement didn't hold up. Faced with these inconsistencies, the investigators continue to grill Mathieu Bulens about the contradictions in his version of events. And within a few hours, the young man goes back on his statement. Actually, no, it isn't true. I didn't have a date with a girl. I was there to see Mrs. Tavernier. This was the tipping point for us. Clearly, Mathieu Boulins was lying. He tells us that on the evening of June 26th, he came from his home in Angoulême to Barbezieux to meet Mrs. Tavernier, who was found dead the next morning in tragic circumstances. So a decision is made to place Mathieu Boulins in custody. 
Investigators now have 48 hours to find out what really happened between the young gendarme and Claude Tavernier. A lawyer, Gaël Godec, is put in charge of the suspect's defense. When I arrived at the cell, Mathieu Bulens was obviously very ill at ease, very withdrawn. And you had a sense that emotionally being detained was putting him under a great deal of strain. The young man then explains to investigators that since the break-in at Claude Tavernier's home in 2008, he has kept in touch with the old lady. During the interviews, Bulens claims that he knew Mrs. Tavernier. Maybe not well, but he knew her. And went several times to her home to chat about things. He seems to have regarded Mrs. Tavernier as a confidante. According to Bulens, relations with Claude Tavernier became so friendly that he used the familiar to form in French when addressing her. For the Tavernier family lawyer, this is simply impossible. This claim is quite implausible. Such familiarity is quite alien to a woman of Madame Claude Tavernier's background, age, and generation. Even her own children called her ma'am. Investigators are perplexed by this relationship between Claude Tavernier and Matthew Bulens, especially as no one connected with either the young man or the elderly lady seems to be aware of it. No one in Claude Tavernier's family ever heard her talk about any visits from Matthew Bulens. You may be quite sure that Mrs. Tavernier would have mentioned it to one of her children or to one of her sons-in-law or granddaughters. That much is certain. We had no eyewitness accounts of Mathieu Boulins and Mrs. Tavernier ever meeting up socially at Mrs. Tavernier's home. Mathieu Boulins continues to deny any involvement in this abominable crime. And nobody among the people who know him can imagine that the former gendarme could possibly have murdered Claude Tavernier. He had no criminal record. Stayed out of trouble, didn't say much. He certainly didn't have the profile of a killer. Further examination of the young man's background reveals new surprises to the investigators. He's a loner, but he has a girlfriend and has just landed a new job. He's taking exams to qualify for work in police forensics. Basically working on crime scenes, taking swabs, doing DNA research, looking for prints. Just a few days after the tragedy, Mathieu even passed his exams to become a criminal identification technician. Could this gendarme and crime scene expert really be the murderer? What if investigators are barking up the wrong tree? The gendarmes then carry out a detailed analysis of Matthew Bulin's phone calls to ascertain whether the suspect called the victim and also to attempt to pinpoint his whereabouts on the night of the crime. There was no telephone contact between Claude Tavernier and Mathieu Bulins over the past year. Now we felt quite sure that he was lying. We realized that on the evening of the 26th through to the 27th at noon, his phone was switched off, so he couldn't be geolocated, which is quite strange because the records show that his phone is permanently active except for that evening of the 26th. The investigators decide to confront the young man with these inconsistencies. Suddenly, his new statement gives the case an unexpected twist. Here he gave us a detail he hadn't told us before, about a first visit to Claude Tavernier's home. A discussion took place between the protagonists. Then Matthew Bulens left the premises, only to return a few minutes later through the back of the house. 
Uh, en passant par derrière, uh, la Then he said he had a flashback. À ce moment-là, uh, qu'il a un flash. Et dans ce flash, and in the flashback, he saw himself stabbing and putting tape over the mouth of Mrs. Tavernier to prevent her from screaming. To former colleagues, these confessions come as a real shock. You have to remember that Boulins even looked after gendarmes' children. He was constantly in the gendarmerie and carried a weapon on his belt. His colleagues had absolute trust in him. So hearing all this was extremely difficult for the soldiers who worked closely with him. The astonishment primarily affects his former commander, Jean-Luc Forestier, one of the first gendarmes to arrive at the crime scene. I just couldn't believe it. It was impossible that this kid had done that. I had never had any problem with him. I couldn't reconcile what I saw at the scene of the crime with the kid that I knew for five years. I couldn't believe that Matthew had anything to do with this murder. No way. While these revelations are a big leap forward for investigators, Matthew Budens is still not revealing any details about the circumstances of the tragedy. Hunting for new clues, investigators search his home. We discovered evidence related to the murder, such as rolls of the same type of sticky tape found previously during the investigation, used to gag and restrain Mrs. Tavernier. We also found cigarette lighters, although Bulins does not smoke. During the search, the suspect is surprisingly cooperative. Moulins pointed investigators towards his mailbox, indicating that he had left a pair of sports shoes and a knife there. The investigators place the knife under seal and send it to the laboratory for analysis, eager to find out whether it is the murder weapon. With regard to the shape of the cutting edge, we knew it wasn't a straight blade. It seemed to be a knife with a degree of curvature, the kind seen in some hunting knives, or a knife with a very sharp tip. Comparing the type of weapon and the type of lesion observed during the autopsy allows us to make a match. So, the knife found at the home of Mathieu Bulens is compatible with the wounds found on the body of Claude Tavernier. To confirm that it is indeed the murder weapon, tests are carried out to see whether traces of the victim's DNA appear on the knife. The knife found in the mailbox does not show any visible sign of blood and has been cleaned. But residual traces of blood are found through the use of a product called Blue Star. Analysis of the residual traces leaves no room for doubt. The DNA found on the knife belongs to Claude Tavernier. To determine whether the DNA found beneath the victim's fingernails is that of Matthew Bulens, investigators collect some of his saliva. The two DNAs are then compared. And there it is, Matthew Bulens' DNA. So you are dealing with the person who killed Mrs. Tavernier. In his interview, Bolins clearly tells us that he regrets his actions. Yet, if we had not come looking for him, he would not have given himself up. He was getting on with his life as normal, despite the barbaric act he'd committed. Mathieu Bulins is formally charged with homicide in the killing of Claude Tavernier. Once again under interrogation, Matthew Bulens remains very evasive on the details of the murder. He had no explanation for his actions, maintaining only that he had flashbacks. He remembered some things, but his only recollection of the actual act of stabbing was of striking a single blow, whereas we know there were 40 or so. In an attempt to reconstruct the events, the investigators are forced to rely on these so-called flashbacks. Celui d'être devant la porte arrière 
standing outside Mrs. Tavernier's back door, seeing her with her meal on a tray, then striking a blow, as if he was outside his body, only coming back to his senses when sitting on the edge of the bed beside the inanimate body of Mrs. Tavernier. This was the moment, according to the young man, when he became aware of his crime and then sought to conceal it. Like a small child trying to conceal his mischief, he called upon all his years of professional experience and tried to cover up the crime he had just committed. He detailed how he went out of the room to light several fires, remembering in particular taking the clock and the TV and loading them into Mrs. Tavernier's vehicle. It could make it look like a robbery, the fact of stealing things, then starting a fire to destroy any evidence implicating him. The young man then allegedly fled. But this version of events doesn't satisfy the investigators. His words were very fragmented. Very little of a statement indicated how the crime developed. So in order to try to determine exactly what had happened, we used several investigative techniques, including morphological testing, whereby specialists study the position of the traces of blood. Many traces of blood were found at the scene of the crime. Analyzing them makes it possible to check whether the version of events described by Matthew Bulens is credible or not. Through observations and measurements of the bloodshed, we can determine a timeline so that if the perpetrator has a hazy memory, morphological testing can at least determine whether what he remembers is compatible with our observations. Pools of blood are found in three places. On the bed, on the outside steps, and in the dining room, where the body of the victim was found. For the experts, it's about making these clues tell their story. A pool of blood indicates a static position, where the blood is pouring from a wound in a given spot. The experts begin their investigations in the bedroom. The traces of blood allow us to establish that the victim was mainly assaulted in the bedroom, probably on the bed. That's where we found the most blood. So it seems that the blows were struck as the victim was lying down, unable to move one way or the other. As a result, the lesions are grouped around the neck region, as is the case here with 30 stab wounds. The bloody trail between the bedroom and the outside steps indicates that the body was moved. Morphological analysis of the blood must now determine whether the victim moved of her own free will or was dragged along the ground. We can distinguish between, for example, slip marks, which indicate that part of a blood source is in contact with the surface sliding along the ground, and passive traces, which are circular. They have completely different shapes. The results are conclusive. According to the experts, Claude Tavernier most definitely tried to flee. The evidence is that the seriously injured victim crawled, as if looking for a way out or seeking access to the outside, as it was the only possible escape. The traces of blood found between the exterior steps and the dining room indicate that the victim was caught by her murderer. Other drag traces were found. It's as if the body had been picked up, pulled and dragged along the ground. It can clearly be seen how Mrs. Tavernier's hand slid along the floor as she was dragged from outside to inside. This assessment shows that Claude Tavernier endured a violent ordeal. But another detail intrigues the investigators. During the autopsy, the pathologist recorded injuries on the victim's back, made with the tip of a knife. Mathieu Bulens does not explain them. The expert, though, offers an explanation. 
One explanation might be that her attacker was trying to get her to move and struck the first blows that way. There's a series of improbabilities, inconsistencies and contradictions in Bulin's statement. And many parts seem unconvincing. The confession does not appear to be a wholly truthful account. While the investigators have ascertained who the perpetrator is, they still don't know his motive. In an attempt to find out what prompted Mathieu Bulens to commit such a crime, a psychiatric expert is called in. Dr. Oba, who is in charge of his assessment, quickly notices that the young man has trouble expressing emotions, including anger. A balanced subject must be able to express his aggressiveness in an appropriate and flexible manner. For a psychiatrist, a highly inhibited subject, one who suppresses his aggression, is potentially very violent. What's more, in the case of Mathieu Bulens, we have clear and detailed evidence of this. Here is a subject who claims to have never exhibited any impulsive or violent behavior. Then all of a sudden, at the moment of the crime, he exhibits a degree of destructiveness that is seldom seen. Hoping to find some explanations, the expert asks Mathieu Bulens about his childhood. He describes it as happy, with a gendarme father who often worked away from home. His mother, to whom he was very close, died of cancer when he was 18. This was a traumatic experience because his mother's cancer was a taboo subject, such that when she died, he was not aware that she had been hospitalized. His great regret is not having told her that he loved her often enough, and now he can barely bring himself to talk about her. When we do talk about his mother, he bursts into tears. This information leads the psychiatrist to ponder the bond that the young man might have struck up with Claude Tavernier. Claude Tavernier was an important person to him, like a, a grandmother a substitute for the maternal figure he had lost. But Dr. Oba's psychiatric assessment takes a different turn. Mr. Bulins closed up as soon as his relationship with Mrs. Tavernier was broached, so much so that we are at a loss. Why did he always visit her in his gendarme's uniform? He offered no explanation for this. However, the psychiatrist establishes that when the crime was committed, Bulens was not suffering from any mental pathology or disorder. He is thus accountable for his actions and able to explain them. Yet the deeper the psychiatric examination goes, the less able he is to do so. Things were becoming increasingly difficult for Mr. Bulens, who was saying less and less about the case and offering less and less information. He was distancing himself from what had happened, as if operating on automatic pilot, claiming an almost total amnesia of the facts. For the expert, there are only two possible explanations for his behavior. Either he is subconsciously suppressing the facts or deliberately lying. The latter seems to better fit the young man's profile. I think he was concealing the crime, concealing his deepest motivations. I wrote in my report that Bulens had locked his secret box because he did not want to give access to what had happened and exercise his right not to offer any explanations. For those close to the victim, this attitude is difficult to tolerate. The tragic thing about this case is that Matthew Bulins killed for no reason, with no explanation. A good woman who would never for one second have thought to hurt him. And for what? It's an inexplicable act of barbarity. Why did Mathieu Bulin stab Claude Tavernier more than 40 times? 
conjecture is rife among investigators and experts. The murderer claims that on the night of the murder, he was unwell, consumed by dark thoughts. Two weeks earlier, his volunteer gendarme contract had ended. It was almost as if he were afraid of disappointing his deceased mother. So he went to visit Claude Tavernier, maybe seeking words of comfort. When she heard firsthand from Matthew Bulins that he was no longer a gendarme, she may have told him it didn't matter not to worry. He could do something else in life. It may be that this did not sit well with Bulins, and he regarded her words as treacherous. To criticize his function was to attack the very thing his mother always wanted him to be. It shook up everything that had motivated his existence since his mother's death. Did Claude Tavernier's words upset Matthew Bulins enough to make him murderous? For the experts, this hypothesis holds water. Having chewed over this exchange, he returns to the home of Mrs. Tavernier, determined to have it out with her. There's a quick, violent explanation, and right then, Matthew Bulins wants to ram Mrs. Tavernier's words down her throat by inflicting several stab wounds. The idea that the murderer sought to ram his victim's words down her throat is a good example of passing from word to deed. These scenarios, though, are only conjecture, and the investigators continue to search for the truth. March 25, 2013, nine months after the tragedy, they hope that a reconstruction will jog Matthew Bulin's memory. As we entered Claude Tavernier's house, we saw Mathieu Bulin's attitude completely change. Here was a man who became so withdrawn, he was even scared to return to Mrs. Tavernier's bedroom. For the young man's lawyer, this attitude has an explanation. It was beyond him, beyond his moral strength. He just couldn't face it because he remembered the scene, despite the many blackouts, and he refused to look at the bed. He looked away. He cried. It was impossible for him. We tried five or six times. I talked to him, told him he had to try again, for the memory of Mrs. Tavernier, but it was totally beyond him. Faced with this situation, the judge turned to a method seldom used in France, hypnosis. This is the first time in my career that I've seen an investigating magistrate use hypnosis to try to determine the motivation for a criminal act. Evelyn Joss is an expert psychologist. She has often used hypnosis to help the Belgian police in their investigations. We use hypnosis in order to find new information in relation to a case such as the face of a perpetrator, a car, a number plate. Under hypnosis, we do not remember things, we actually relive them, so it's much more powerful. Investigators rely heavily on this technique to make Matthew Bulins talk. But first, the young man must agree to submit himself to it. Anyone can be hypnotized, as it is a very natural state. In these trance-like moments, others are speaking, but we don't hear them. We are quite capable of disconnecting ourselves and being completely in our inner world. But we must really want to do it, really accept it. Matthew Bulens agrees to be hypnotized, but given his emotional state, it's decided that the hypnosis should take place in a prison van. The session then takes place outside the crime scene. But it does not yield the hoped-for results. The psychologist gives an explanation. When a person is in a hypnotic state, they are aware of what they are saying. You cannot force someone to say something or do something under hypnosis. They maintain a level of control. To take a ridiculous example, if it was so easy to get people to divulge information, every week you'd read reports in the newspapers about hypnotherapists emptying their patients' Swiss bank accounts.
So if he wants to be secretive, he obviously has no reason to describe what he's reliving. While investigators have failed to shed light on the murder of Claude Tavernier, some of the evidence suggests that Bulin's actions may have been premeditated. He comes to the house with tape, with a lighter. Even though he doesn't smoke, and he brings a knife. Why? Of course, it may be pure coincidence, but these three coincidences occurred at the same time, in the same place, which raises the question of whether the items were knowingly brought to Mrs. Tavernier's by Bulins for a specific reason. Concerning the tape used to gag his victim, Bulins offers the investigators an explanation. He kept maintaining that the packing tape was in his pocket because he had recently moved house, which is why he still had balls of tape in his pants pocket. But for Michel Faure, this explanation contradicts findings made on the crime scene and does not hold up. We found strands of hair belonging to the victim on the sticky part of the tape, which had been stuck to the victim's mouth. The fact that it was so sticky and had never previously been used means it probably came from a roll. So it seems that Mathieu Berlin's came to Barbezieux with the intention of visiting the victim. But he came with tape, a knife, and a lighter. And for us, that suggests premeditation. While the case of Claude Tavernier's murder was finally solved, the culprit could quite easily have never been found because everything started with a sighting by gendarme Sylvain Morin, who just happened to be passing by. You tell yourself you've seen something serious, something that cost a person's life. The gendarme's uniform was the trigger. If it had been someone else, maybe I wouldn't have paid so much attention. I only noticed him because of the gendarme's uniform. It was the key to everything. If he'd passed that way five seconds earlier or five seconds later, he wouldn't have seen anything. So I think the investigators owe him a big thank you. As for the motive and the exact circumstances of the crime, only Mathieu Bulens knows the whole truth. Maybe one day he will be able to reveal it. My great regret is not being able to meet Matthew. I would have liked to have seen him, if only for two minutes, to look him in the eye. Maybe I would have seen something in his eyes. I might have been able to understand something. It would have done me good. I hope that one day Mathieu Boulins can explain what happened, for the family's sake. I hope so because the family has experienced a real tragedy and needs to know why. Claude Tavernier's family is not driven by feelings of hatred. They just want explanations. They have said very clearly that they are ready to forgive. But it requires Matthew Bulins to acknowledge under what circumstances he acted and how and why. That's where forgiveness lies.